Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 266. That's 266. Dos siete siete. Dos siete siete. Uno, dos siete siete. Dos siete siete. Oh my god, my magic's getting horrible. Anyway, how you guys doing? How you guys feeling? Good, amazing. Glad to have you here. Glad to have you back in the sector as you can tell i'm alive i'm well i'm nice and um lubricated i think so i think i'm lubricated am i lubricated i think i'm lubricated i'm nice and warm nice and fine feeling good feeling calm hope you guys are well i've just got back from a workout i've had a nice breakfast i've prepared my lunch for the rest of the quiet of the week or a bit of the weekend and now i'm going to do this podcast before i head off to work and entertain you guys for the next hour and a half in it so if you are um sitting down listening to this via the podcast app leave me a five star review please if you're watching via youtube smash that like button and click and subscribe and if you're just passing by and you don't give a toss sit back and enjoy all right cool anyway before we get started i wanted to remember this because um there's been this little meme going on twitter at the moment about twitter moments, twitter moments in a decade most of them are specific to twitter so stuff you might have seen in the last decade according to twitter but i've pulled up this little clip that was um, something I saw live on TV during the Commonwealth Games, I assume, when I was, well, I think w- when I was living at home, I'm pretty sure. And me and my brothers were just literally dying with laughter when we saw this live. Um, I'm sure for the guys and girls who are not UK based, you won't get this reference. But regardless, I hope this is quite funny to you nonetheless. Here we go. Well, that was a good performance there. So, we have a gloriously sunny day here in the studio. <laughs> Um, we've seen some action this morning as well. Jessica Ennis, good night. <laughs> I know for some people that's not funny, but it's so hilarious. That was to give you a bit of background. That's um, Otis uh, Otis Daily there, um, one of uh, one of the BBC presenters, and um, which is a you know TV broadcasting station in the UK here. And I think it was during the Commonwealth Games or the Olympics, one of them along those kind of lines. And He's basically um, trying to intro or trying to wrap up a segment of the show, but I'm guessing he doesn't get his timing right. So as he starts talking, I'm pretty sure he's producing his ears telling him, oh, you got to wrap up, you got to wrap it up. So as he's talking and saying, oh, so I'm set the scene, he has got to wrap it up. So now he's trying to end the scene and he ends up saying, <laughs> before he passes it on to his presenter, whose name is Jessica Ennis, <laughs> he tells the crowd, good night. He tells the audience, good night. But it's, you know, it's clear as day. It's super sunny out. And he's telling the audience good night because obviously that's what he's got in his head about passing it on. It's complete, absolute clusterfuck. The entire thing was horrible. I think um, throughout the entire day, he just he was just he just had one of those bad days as a presenter. He was sitting alongside Michael Johnson, the world famous um, sprinter for the two hundred meters. I think he set the record for that. And then I think it got so bad that Michael Johnson had just, had just took charge. I remember it being um, the camera. Basically, they had they had three people in frame on the TV show. They had um, Otis Daly on one side, and then Michael Johnson and the other guest on the show. So usually it was another former athlete. And then um, whenever they were in a normal setting, Otis Daly would be sort of like um, setting the questions and then throwing them to the athletes, and the athletes would be looking at Otis Daly. But because Otis Daly was doing so badly, they had to just switch it and have the athletes just talking to themselves. Otis Daly would introduce a, to- a topic. And they'll just keep talking amongst themselves. I think I think I'm actually have an example of it here, um, of them just taking complete charge of the situation and not allowing um, Otis Daly to mess it up a bit as much as he already has, right? So I think this is it. Yeah, Michael Johnson taking charge. So a very solid so look at performance here, right? there from. The so in frame, you've got the three athletes here or the three presenters. You've got two former athletes on the, on the left. I think the guy on the left here is the white guy who's I think was famous for doing the hurdles, and you've got also got Michael Johnson in the middle. And then Otis Daly kind of sets the question. Michael, what does it mean for and someone look, like look you to does. come here and run a race like that? <laughs> oh, I think he obviously he just switches like over to the referee coming back and they just start talking to each other. Look, uh, he is the defending. No, he's running look, a and they just start bit talking to each other out. and no one and they don't switch it back to Otis at all. No one inside. He's been training for 21 months. He hasn't been racing as well as he could have for five three. And he knows. I love it, man. I absolutely love it. That's the one thing that actually got me got me um I got I got excited when I saw that. But anyway um. Plenty of stuff to talk about here on the news. I want to get into more stuff than I can shake a stick at. So hopefully you guys will stick around. 
Um, yeah, loads of streetwear topics. Today's going to be quite street specific. I've got a lot of news that I haven't actually been able to kind of round up. So I'm going to try and get through as much of that as I can today. And then obviously tomorrow do the best that I can with the rest of the topics I have left over. Um, so let's see and get right into topics. Let's not waste any more time and start talking about the things that I've seen on the internet. That I think will be of interest to you listeners. Let's get this off the screen. Boom, boom, boom. Get that off there as well. Du, 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 du. Let's get this off the screen as well, if we don't mind here. Can we move off the screen as well, please? Yes, we can. Okay, what's the first topic here? What do we have? Oh, okay, so an update on Fold. Again, man, bloody hell. It never ends with Fold, innit? They're always going through something. Um, what you call it? Oh, totally offering my support to them in the over the e-waves, over the interwebs, hoping those guys are holding strong and holding firm because they're going to be... They're in one hell of a dogfight when it comes to keeping the license open. As I'm sure you guys are aware, Fold's been going through a protracted um, license dispute with the local council. It being can it being so new on local council due to a pending charge against two of the people involved in Fold uh, regarding the equipment that was bought there. The charges allege that the equipment that was bought, I think up to two hundred thousand of it, was bought with illicit funds that came through money laundering or something on those kind of lines. Um, Fold completely denies any wrongdoing and is vehemently fighting against. It. It, but one of the founders of Fold, who was charged for the um, crime, has now been ordered to completely stay away from Fold, no involvement with it whatsoever, until they kind of run the run the actual course of the investigation. So it's all up in the air. But we got some good news previously that they were going to remain open pending the appeal. But now the license has been fully revoked. But you know, with the protracted state, with with how things work in terms of licensing agreements, they can still appeal it now. So they've kind of put out another statement again regarding the whole situation. I'm going to put up here on screen. This is from Fold. It says the following. This is actually a picture, I think, from the back of the DJ booth, I'm pretty sure. Or the front of the DJ booth, sorry. The front where people near stand next to the front, I'm pretty sure, on this stage. But this was uploaded about four hours ago. And this is the following. Um, unfortunately, at yesterday's hearing, we had our license revoked, meaning that Fold remains under threat. Whilst this is hugely frustrating, we can and will stay open whilst we appeal this decision, which is awesome because if you are like myself and you're looking forward to going to the Innovisions London Label Night next week on the 14th, is it the 14th? I'm pretty sure it's the 14th. Is it the 14th? Next week, the 14th. Yes, the 14th. Then I'm sure you guys will be happy about that. And for anyone also going to the 24 hours, 24 7 party with Resident Advisor this weekend, you're also going to be happy about that news as well. Um, so this weekend and for the foreseeable future, it will be business as usual. All the support we have received throughout is this difficult period, not only from our community, but from the diverse members of the creative world, will not go in vain. Once we continue to fight our corner, we are confident that our appeal will be successful and to continue to defend ourselves. We are standing strong in the face of the continued adversity and are confident that the police and the licensing will continue, will conclude that we have not acted in an improperty, impropriety, sorry. In one year, we have built a hub, a home, and a united so many different people from so many different backgrounds. We will not let that go. When we will, when, when we open the doors this weekend, we look forward to seeing all our fold family on the dance floor. Yeah, man. I'm really bummed out about it. I hope they get it. I hope they get it sorted out. As I mentioned to a few people before or on this podcast beforehand, Fold is the best nightclub in London, hands down. I don't think anyone else can deny that or contest against it. I think the fact that they were able to come in and basically provide everything that we've been missing in terms of club culture when it comes to the community side of things. I think the the programming has improved over the last couple of months. I feel like they've kind of definitely hit their groove. They've got a lot of residents playing there now. They've got a lot of friends and family doing label nights. They're not trying to get the kind of, you know, the big blockbuster names to kind of fill the space. And I think the ref and family and friends are doing a good job of basically promoting it, which is helping because I think they had a bit of a weird period after the first party where they were kind of trying to get the big names to kind of fill the, the venue, but it wasn't quite working. And the friends and family didn't know too, of it, didn't really know of it too well. But now they sort of hit their groove. And I guess in my experience, I've kind of seen that it's kind of got bigger just through word of mouth. Obviously, videos like mine can help, but people just proselytizing about it over social media has helped. But it's it goes to show just how much of a gap, just how much of a gap there was in the market for a place like Fold, um, a place where people who are interested in dance music, interested in electronic music can go and sort of like, you know, um, whittle down the, you know, kind of waste the day away or night away. Uh, dancing to amazing music set by amazing DJs in a completely safe space. And if you're familiar with any of the club kids that go there, you'll know that it probably is the only place in London, maybe apart from Cause and a few other places that are able to embrace, um, you know, the freaks and the geeks of the industry that make it so special. So we're hoping that this appeal goes through well 
and they're able to succeed. I have a strong feeling that it will, and I have the strong feeling if it doesn't, that all the good work they've done now on the scene, someone will come forward and probably propose them an idea of maybe co-partnering in the space or acting as a front, as a face for us, for a venue that is un, unoccupied at the moment. I have a feeling of it. Same with the cause. I think the cause are the same sort of thing. I think the people that were, I think even the, they mentioned it previously in it, another article that one of the neighbours found their, you know, one of their recent spots that they're now paying another lease on. So I think would fold all this goodwill they've got out there. I think someone will recognise it and see how much, how important it is to the local community and will probably offer them a solution. But I'm hoping this original site, the one that I went to for the first party, the one that's in the heart of Canning Town, again, for me, it's a, it all comes full circle. I'm from Canning Town. My mum still lives there now. I see her mostly every other weekend to have a nightclub like fold in the area that I grew up in. An area that, you know, for the most part, when I was growing up in, had no sort of like electronic dance music scene at all. Um, it's great to see and also to see the kind of abundance of people. Um, like I said, all the weirdos hanging around Shatford and making, I mean, hanging around Canning Town and making it interesting has uh made that whole area just like you know get a new lease of life so i really hope they hang around I really hope the appeal is successful and for anyone that's supporting fold or anyone that's a fan of fold who hasn't been there yet definitely check out the resident advisor night that's happening i think this weekend at uh, fold and obviously the individual label night which i'm sure the tickets are sold out on but i'm pretty sure you can probably get them at the places like ticket tannoy and other little resale places but definitely go to fold this weekend for the resident advisor night support those guys and girls give them your love uh buy some drinks at the bar put your stuff in the locker room and just generally be there in it for the stuff that they do where's the event i'm pretty sure it's this weekend the london 24 7 thing let me see if i can find it for you guys oh it's actually on, oh, okay it's on a saturday actually it's on the 7th that's the same day as the, the boxing so definitely go and check those out this is a night coming up for this weekend resident advisor 24 7 london it's there tickets are still available now the description of it is for the first for the first ever London edition of our 24-7 party series, we brought together a lineup that's a love letter to the UK rave and London club culture. Come down to fall to take part in a 24-hour multifaceted event across a venue's never before seen spaces. You can sit in on the panel discussions, broaden your knowledge and workshops, stumble upon secret raves, and much more. Get stuck in. So definitely check those out. Um, it'd be great to see, man. All the support and love to them and you know, as they go down this fight, because I'm pretty sure it's not the most entertaining thing in the world, going to local council meetings and trying to fight your case, trying to, you know, convince, you know, general public why you should, why they should allow a nightclub that's on the other side of the train tracks from, you know, residential area to stay open until 6 a.m. It probably isn't the most easiest job to do, but I'm sure the local council will be understanding of their, of the kind of value they brought to the area. And I'm pretty sure the local businesses too will be able to vouch for them too. I'm sure places like McDonald's and even the off-license around the corner, the 24-7 one, has probably seen an uptake in people coming in and some money at the at the tills ultimately. So hopefully we see that going forward. Fingers crossed for everyone involved there. And again, um, just offer them your support, man. Go and support those guys. Buy tickets. Go to the rave. Get some drinks. Hang out there. Go to a smoking area. Buy a cigarette or two. You know what I mean? And just hang out with those guys and girls. Next on the list here, let's move on. What we have here to talk about? Should we go to the Maxim or the... Yeah, Instagram DJs. Let's talk about Instagram DJs. This is a mixed mag article. A really interesting one, actually. Let me just have it in. I should blow my nose before we continue here. Oh. Sinuses are better now at the moment because of my... I've been using a lot, my, I've been using my uh, inhaler a lot recently, so my sinuses have improved. So if you've heard me speaking on a podcast and you've heard me sound a bit nasally, then you'll know that, you know, I had nasal issues. But now with this, uh, you know, with the uh, added help of this little gizmo here, which happens to be an inhaler, I'm now, you know, a little bit healed. Not fully healed, but, you know, it helps, it helps a little bit. So let me use this now before we continue. <sighs> Okay, there we go. Done. Ready to rock. Ready to rock and roll. So, Mixed Mag, I've got the series of articles they're putting out, I think, to tie in with maybe the Christmas thing as the advent calendar. I'm not too sure, but it's a little article. Let's have a read of it. I haven't really checked it out, but I thought the headline was pretty interesting. Let's have a read and see what we think of this. The article from Mixed Mag titled, How Instagram Has Changed DJ Culture, which I don't know like, it has. I'm, no, I'm still, trying to, I'm still gra grappling with it, actually trying to work out what works best for me because I've always found that the instagram the dj instagram thing works when you're like pretty established and you maybe you might have a full crowd in front of you and you also might have some hangers on 
you know, some, you know, groupies hanging around the DJ booth who could help you out by doing a video. But when you're on your own playing in the pub with like 10 people in it, it's quite hard to like, you know, prop the camera up and make yourself look like Armin Van Buren, do you know what I mean? So it gets a bit redundant doing it that way. You could, There's only so many pictures or videos of the mixer you can take before people start thinking, why aren't you pointing that thing upwards? <laughs> why aren't you pointing at the dance floor? Because no one's there. <laughs> but anyway, let's continue with this article. How to Gamma's Change DJ Culture. Uh, work camera flash how dj cameras have changed dj culture since launching in 2010 instagram has had a disruptive impact on dance music wow it's been a decade of instagram madness isn't it 2010s are almost over in case you somehow missed it amidst the um engorged list engorged list okay i don't know what that is list season and effective long reads akin to this with them we leave behind various post future um genres Post future, post genres, iron, ironic or not ironic, fashion trends, and hopefully a Tory government. Why does everyone hate the? Can you? Is that a way to kind of really mess up a dinner party? Imagine just saying you voted Tory. Imagine saying you're a Tory in and out. Imagine saying you like that pretty Patel woman. Is it pretty? Pretty, pretty Patel is your, is your stepmom or something? Would you get kicked out of the house party if you did that? Maybe, isn't it? Bloody hell. Being a Tory in, in the UK is hard. Anyway, a deluge of launches, innovations, and cultural renovations have emerged this decade, including Instagram, which popped up in late 2010 and has spent the ensuing nine years wrapping society in multiple ways. Our newfangled I gram, therefore I am motto has led to the birth of influencers, meme accounts, and URL stan fandoms from cultural hotspots and more excitedly remote locations, plus an onslaught of multi hyphenate artists. Much to the delight of brands, naturally. Instagram has grown to become a lucrative tool for money making means across the creative industries. These days, DJs and producers can essentially market PR and create editorial content all via their phones. Career booths from a packed tour calendar to more press coverage to wider audiences are available to them if they navigate the platform with what would be deemed a successful approach. To, to some, it comes naturally, for others, it's a result of willing of a wily planning driven by an increasing acceptance that it isn't just music that does a talking of course and i think you've seen that happening a lot in the stand-up world i think i always ascribed i always kind of talk about stand-up because of course i listen to a lot of stand-up comedy and i will hopefully in the future maybe next week do my first stand-up comedy set sometime soon um next week i'm gonna do i'm gonna put out the new reefer or in the universe i have to do it next week and not be an absolute pussy but i take a lot of influence from it because i think they have also been grappling or wrestling with the idea of self-promotion because in a comedy world it's probably looked down upon more so in the maybe electronic music world self-promotion is the big thing people are all about the jokes all about the stand-up or they, they kind of wear the fact that they've been in it 10 years plus on their sleeve they tattoo it on their chest they put it on their hat they will tattoo it on their face like six nine tattoo or something do you know what I mean like they're really proud of the fact that the years they put in so the idea of circumventing it or quote-unquote cheating by posting stuff on social media isn't a way to go now it's sort of changed i think a lot of comedians are realizing that if you've got 10 years in the game it's only going to add to your appeal if you're also able to promote yourself and the fact that you've been in the game for so long via social media you're sort of leaving money on the table by not using it um the electronic music world i've kind of seen a weird divide i think for the most part it's weird to judge because for the most part the most successful djs the ones that are making the most money like commercially are usually the ones that are pretty heavy on social as well the ones that are possibly the the ones that are the cult favorites or the ones that are the djs dj with that kind of person they're not that heavy on social media like i think of someone like a dj hell right i don't think he's going to be posting his arms out wide um in front of a dj crowd anytime soon but he's well respected in, in the in the dj circles someone like a good jansen's a similar example i don't think he posts um peggy goo type videos on on instagram of, of that like so it's quite hard for up and coming gd to judge and it's quite hard also for other people to compare themselves against because where do you fall do you fall in the DJ hell line where you're going to get booked regardless of your leg because it's based, mostly based on your legacy? Or do you go full frontal and quote unquote really haul yourself out on social media and really throw it in people's face, remind them day in, day out that you're a DJ, you're a DJ, you make music, you buy vinyl, you like fashion, you're a DJ, you're a DJ. How, how often do you do that before it gets too much? Similar to like people that work out, right? Um, gym workout people, like how far do you have to go until you start to feel cringe? Or is it more of a question of like, it doesn't matter how far you do it, the way the algorithm works, people are not going to see every post that you upload. So you're, and plus you're not trying to convince your friends that you're a DJ. You're trying to put it out there in order to kind of gain new business. I'd assume that's why you're doing it, right? I'd assume most people that are posting on social, especially DJ wise, are doing it because they want to gain get get some new leads, 
hopefully um, put out the image that they're, you know, that they're a big person in the scene. Um, the article continues. Um, take the rise of Peggy Goo. Huh? Just spoke about her now, for example. But it playing, be it playing to the crowds, adoring, swaving fans, designing clothes, either collabority or for her label, Karen, kicking back wearing designer clothes in selfies or front row at fashion week. She's created her feet to portray Peggy Goo, trademark. The brand in order to offer a desirable content and aspiring uh, inspirational appeal for both her fans and the brand she chooses to work with. On October 2018, Peggy teamed up with Instagram for a behind the scenes style video hosted on the platform's official feed and filmed in Amsterdam during ADAD in a move that highlights her interest to do more and share more via the platform. But the thing with Peggy Goo that's awesome is that she's an actual, she's, she's, she's about this life it seems like from what I've seen of her on social. She actually produces music. She's obviously a classically trained pianist, you know, as most Asian people are. She's a fucking boss on the piano, um, which obviously will translate very well to the um, electronic music scene. I'm pretty sure she mentioned in the interview that her parents are quite musically inclined too, which is great. Um, Korean background, you know, raised up in, or kind of, you know, come to prominence in London and Berlin. So loads of interesting influences there. And just she just doesn't seem, she just seems unashamed when it comes to personal social. She's very... A matter of fact about it sort of similar to like a style bubble was her name style bubble what's her name the asian girl that uh, from london that i find really annoying but it's really good on social media but just she's really good i think there's a they, they need, there's a certain personality that lends itself to being really self-promotional or wise on social and i think she's perfect for it what's this video about her on instagram i didn't see this actually so i got a link to it so this is a video of her at the ins with instagram film what is it behind the scenes look at what she does okay uh, during ade for last year Let's see what this sounds like. Oh, I love it. I love her outfit. Let's see. Last week, Peggy. Oh, let's just pause that. Oop, I'm sorry. Let me go back then and read what it says here. So Peggy Goo. I love the outfit. Last weekend, Pe DJ and producer Peggy Goo performed for the second time at the Amsterdam dance event, which I'm been told is a very beneficial place to go to if you want to do some business you can make some contacts with that sort of malarkey and network and do that whole smooching stuff which is great i would probably like to go to amsterdam for the first time ever to go to deck mantle but you know ade i'm not i'm not uh, i'm not against it if anyone from out there from ade is watching send man an invite uh it's continuous here so looking out into the river somewhere growing up korea i used to listen to a lot of k-pop i listened to edm like i listened to hip-hop I was always interested in music, you know. I was one of those kids like putting the walk. Yeah, this is very hard to do if you're a DJ that really is about this life and you don't want to be that self promotion person. Because I'm sure behind the scenes, I'm sure she's probably aware of this. Other DJs are probably talking quite negatively about it, which is weird, right? Because do you remember when Seth, um, what's Seth Chuckster? When Richie Horton was doing, you know, his James Murphy phase and he was doing everything under the sun, collaborating, making machines, modular machines, making mixers this and that doing a sake thing like he was all over the place right was there any backlash behind what he was doing i don't think there was really was there i don't know maybe social media wasn't around as it is it wasn't as prevalent as it was back then maybe i'm not too sure but he was heavy in it and he was around all the ogs who were just constantly like you know i'd say richie horton was that era around you know richie richie horton the same era as maybe a, a luciano and a ricardo de lobos right even though they're probably not the same musical um taste buds and stuff and what they play but they're the same kind of generation. And you would never see Luciano or Ricardo Villalobos doing any of that sort of extra stuff that Richie Hoyt was doing, right? They're obviously quite charismatic behind a DJ booth and are quintessential DJ rock stars, but they're very much about the music and about DJing only. That's all they do. And then Richie Hoyt was flying around doing all this other stuff. And I didn't feel that there was any pushback. And I even remember him sitting down with some restaurateur guy and having this really um, self-indulgent conversation about how food and music, are the, you know, those kind of conversations... Uh, where they're sort of like both wanking each other off, which is, you know, I'm a big fan of it. I love Richie Horton. He's, he's one of my heroes. But I don't know, man. I feel quite cringe watching this, but then I might also imagine, you know, why should you? If I felt all right watching Richie Horton sit down with some restaurateur for an hour talking about how, you know, bloody sushi is the same as mixing. Come in and my, my parents, you know, like, and then dancing around. But moving back to london as amazing as it must be to as it must be it must be to, as as amazing as it must be to be peggy goo it also must be quite daunting knowing that every time you walk into a room people are talking about you about how you're promoting especially with that video of her standing next to a portion it's a bit like oh man the, like she's gone but i don't know if this is a wise thing to do like when you start in your career just to go full pelt take say yes to all the promotions all the brand endorsements 
And then once you start getting a bit older and the brand doesn't start to kind of wane because obviously naturally they're only doing it now because she's a fresh faced, attractive young Asian woman. But once she gets a bit older, we know how discriminatory these entertainment fields are, especially with women when they get older. They're going to start easing off, right, on the brand endorsements that they give. I, I'd imagine so, right? I don't know. Does Nina Kravitz get a lot more deals? I don't know. I don't know if that's true. Maybe I'm talking out of hand. But I know in Hollywood, generally women tend to, like, get less roles or the older they get, whereas men is the opposite way, right? But also with men too, brand endorsements, no one's going to... No one's going to give, no no youth-led brand is going to, you know, endorse Richie Horton for stuff because he's not about that life, innit? You'll rather go to the younger kids who are doing the kind of hands-in-air stuff like the Michael Beebees and shit, right? I'd imagine so, but I don't know. It got me into house and techno scene. I never heard music like that in my life before. <laughs> I also like how open she is about stuff, right? She discovered stuff recently and just got obsessed by it. She doesn't make up this story that, oh, yeah, my dad was, you know, had had an EP on hard wax back in the day. You know, those kind of dumb stories people always make up that, you know, obviously lies. She just like say, look, I think she mentioned something about her parents being music inclined, but it had nothing to do with her electronic music career. They wanted her to be a classically trained pianist and she went off and did her own thing. She dropped out of uni and just started, you know, immersing herself in the culture. Um, I like how honest she is about that sort of stuff. Anyway, let's go back to the article. This is this is a bit boring, isn't it, really, to watch this. But you can check this out yourself. Let's go back to the article and we can go from there. Um, for DJs on the rise, your platform and the brands that prioritize Instagram can help to further their career thanks to social media's viral potential, which allows both the artists and their posts to be quickly shared and viewed by a global scale relatively short periods of time. Uh, but by projecting the inside of a club to the world and an inverse effect is happening with some dealers adapting sets to appeal beyond the dance floor. Oh, okay. Subtlety, subtlety doesn't make for a snippet likely to gain much attraction. So doing, so dueling out bangers or doling out bangers to appeal to videographers as well as a crowd is clinical route to rise to up the algorithm. I never thought about that really, innit? Yeah, true, because I guess if you're going to mix, this is the thing I've always wondered, actually, when you're mixing something... Yeah, when you're doing a mix and you're playing in front of a crowd and you've got an Instagram thing you want to post, when do you decide to do it? Do you do it when you're about to do a really tight mix? Because when, when I'm in the tight, when I want to do a tight mix, I'm very much in the zone. I'm concentrating. I'm making sure that I'm not clanging. I'm making sure I got the EQs right. That I'm hearing the monitors okay. I'm making sure that whatever I'm mixing, people are starting to like and they're not, it's not kind of clearing the dance floor, right? You're not really trying to focus on the camera. You're not trying to give your finger. You're not mixing. It's hard to do it at the same time unless you get one of those braces that you wear. So I'd imagine most DJs are probably giving the phone to somebody and then saying, and then kind of selecting a song that's a banger and then telling them, pointing to them when to start recording and then starting to get their hands in the air, right? Like how that DJ Alicia does, who I'm a, I'm a fan of, but she's a bit cringe when it comes on social or online. I'm sure she's aware of it, but you know, she has to do what she has to do. But this DJ um, that I follow on Twitter is sort of similar. And I guess this is what people are trying. And again, you can hate as much as you want, but she's got an actual excellent EP out there. She should check out Alyssa. That I, like. I don't even pronounce her name. Is it Alyssa or Alicia? I'm not sure if you pronounce it, but I, I like her. She's, she seems pretty sound. And she's always kind of got some, always some fun opinions on your social. But this girl, um, she posts a lot of videos of her arms out wide. It was quite funny. It's a, it's a bit of, it's a kind of, it's, it's, it's basically a meme, right? So this girl here, she's got a, picture, a post of her playing at free free at free free eight. Um, there we go. Put this up on the screen for you guys to show. That. Too loud. There she's there. See those hands in there. So that sort, you know, so that sort of stuff. So what you, so do you have to give somebody the phone when that's playing? Like, there's no other, you know, because how do you know, like when you're starting to mess around the fields, someone's, someone's already got their phone or do you get your friend to just record you for ages and then when you go back home, you just start clipping and cutting it up. I don't know, but it's interesting, isn't it? Because she's clearly got, her friend's clearly got the, the phone right when it's about to drop. And then, you know what I mean? You're going to have to do that sort of stuff, which is hard. And again, this only works when you're playing in an amazing place like 338 and you're a really, you know, you're on the rise sort of DJ like Alyssa. Like if you're like me and you're playing in bars and pubs, you know, in front of people that are eating burgers and, you know, watching the rugby, you know, it's a bit difficult to have these videos out there on social. It continues. Um, let's go back to the article. That um, That's not to say that these viral moments are always forced. There has been... Uh, many positive outcomes arising from clips of killer DJs wholeheartedly letting loose. A samurai co-founder of Manchester label Club Night Swing Ting offered his take. He suggests that while there can be some pressure to create them, 
They can have both the creators of other great acts, calling them a mix of both force and positivity, of both forcing and positive rediscovery. Okay, cool. Plus, this guy, um, Swing Ting, says, no, what's his, guy, what's his name? Uh, Samurai says the following. Plus, it's cool to be able to see footage from sets that you maybe didn't see previously from around the world. This also means that gatekeepers have to take notice of the DJ or promotion that's doing their thing regardless. For example, an amazing DJ doesn't just remain a local secret anymore. That's true. Um, that's part of the reason how I discovered a lot of my songs and a lot of my tunes, a lot of my heroes. I used to always, I've told you before in the beginning, when I used to, when I really got into Ricardo Villalobos, I'd spend every weekend basically following his career, following his basically gigs on RA and then going on um, YouTube and typing in his name and whatever venue he played in and then doing like upload date, kind of, you know, the search history. And then um, I'd basically try and find clips of people recording his sets in the clubs. And usually they're recording his sets mostly because of tune ideas. But some of the times I'll be able to get the song and kind of shazam it while listening to it on my laptop. So a lot of those communi- a lot of the communication through clubs I got was through those little clips. So I'd imagine it would do the same for a DJ, right? Imagine if a if a clip you got goes viral on like a Tifa Techno Twitter handle page or one of those other meme accounts on social media on Instagram specifically. That would that would take you from hero to zero really, really quickly. So I'm I'm all for it, man. Um, former mix mag manager, former mix mag mix mag maga. Okay, Hover Sounds co-founder and certified international star Shereel, uh is one of those amazing DJs who blew up at the beginning of the year thanks to a viral success of Boiler Room Stream, revealing her talents behind the deck. So of course, yeah, that's the one that the guy pulled out the song up for her, right? The tune, and she got pissed. She's since signed to an agency and played high-profile gigs across Europe and the US, and drawn attention for likes of Virgil Abloh, who clocked the post circulating on social media and reached out, and Cheryl Hover Sounds cohort Narnia. Okay, what's what's this clip? Is this the clip that they've got in here? What's this clip? Sample and reached out. What did we shout about? What did Virgil reach out to about? Okay, here it is, right? So this is the clip, I think. Okay, cool. I don't want to get taken off, but that's the basic clip. You basically seen it of her going crazy behind the decks having fun. Big up Shereel. Um and Narnia is another name utilizing the platform to both document her career movements also while while also being, you know, social. Since her career kickoff, she's used her Instagram as a blog or portfolio of sorts to document her career moments or projects she's proud of. It's a good form of self-promotion, she said. If you want to see what someone's up to, like where is Nanya playing next, who's on the next radio show, who's going to be released on label, you know the DJ and artists who are most likely to use the platform. So I see her. There's her Instagram there. What's her name? Nanya. I'm not sure who Nanya is. Who's Nanya? Nanya, Nanya, who's this person? In sessions with Nanya. Uh, okay, cool. A girl that's probably playing some cool club music, yeah? Do your thing. Let's continue with the article here. Ba, 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 ba. It's a sentiment that's bang face weekend the founder James and Acid agrees with. Instagram almost fully replaced the old forms of promo like flyers and posters and forums. The main the aim is still the same to spread the word organically. Social media generally works well for music events because people plan most of their social time there. If a mashup of memes, throwback, nostalgic, indicing, rave shots and colourful promotion videos are your jam, look no further than Banfax's profile. The festival's grid is filled with smartly curated, wholly on brand series of images. Okay, cool. We go there. There's a clear method to madness, even Bankface case. It all follows the logical pattern. Each event will begin with a lineup info, then the fans address theme, and which can go in many directions. Then you have the photos and videos and set recordings for the parties. But it's not for everyone. It shouldn't have to be. You don't need to be. You don't need to be what? Um, you don't need an article to tell you that. Take minute based producer Ski Mask, who's doing more than fine. I can, f- I, I think we can all agree. Receiving universal acclaim for his latest album, Compro, which I can recommend you check out. I saw Ski Mask actually play uh, in Mixed Garage actually a few weeks ago. That was really good, including placing 2018 best album list on Pitchfork, RA, in fact, and, and our own. But even he sometimes feels the pressure. Um, does he feel the pressure, Ski Mask? Okay, fair enough, man. Nowadays, as an artist, he says you only need to look around one ar- around once, and you see 99% of the other producers or DJs using platforms like Insta, um, because it makes you think that it's necessary to important to succeed. Of course, like I said, cult heroes like Gerd Jansen and DJ Hell aren't using Instagram as much as you know a, a Peggy Goo and the nastier is. But you know, I think for the up and coming DJ, you probably have to just decide where you want to go. I think that's the whole premise of this article. Where do you want to be? Do you want to be Armin Van Buren? Do you want to be, um, you know, Carl Cox and stuff? 
then maybe you might have to utilize Instagram in a different way. If you just want to be a cult favorite and have the ability to tour all your favorite clubs that might not necessarily be the, you know, arenas or stadiums or massive festivals that somebody like Amelia Lens does, then probably don't do that sort of stuff. But if you want to be Amelia Lens, you have to look at her Instagram and see how social she is, see how active she's on social and just have to ramp it up the same way. It based in your own way, of course, but you have to do that. And, you know, it's the only way to do it. You can't, I don't, I don't like the thing of like pointing and hating at those people when you kind of want that success yourself, I think you have to decide what you want and then kind of work backwards, I would imagine. Um, so he says, this schema says, um, schema cites the example of artist Helena Hoof as a good example for those who still cultivate a huge fan base and attract mass crowds despite the lack of online presence, admiring her focus on her craft and interest away from social media. Elsewhere, the rise of phones on the dance floor debate might have come old man shouts at the clouds for talking point. Duh, duh, duh. This transpires in various forms for the dazzle, the camera flash. Okay. It's a pretty long article and it's keep going on and on and on and on. on. What, what, what's, what, what's the conclusion here at the end? Let's see. Da, da, da. Okay, it goes about saying that Instagram will continue to play a part on the dance music world with and without visible likes well into the 2020s. Well, at least until we all hop on the next platform. Um, but despite this impact, social media does have a unsuitable grip on dance music. Although there are obvious bonuses for those that navigate the, and uh, navigate with care and keep their mental health in check while engaging with platforms like Instagram, there is still successful artists who reject the online presence. Who is that? They got here an article they rejected. Okay, Neil's fam. If I clock myself on social media too much, I call someone or throw myself into editing emails or DJing. We really need to clock how much time we're spending on social media and do something about it if we think it's affecting us mentally, which is Nanya says, which I agree with. I think the idea that people do, I think I remember, I think I heard Brendan Shaw from Fire the Kids say, he kind of, I know Joe Rogan does the same sort of thing. He just posts and dumps, which is what I do. I just post and dump. I don't really go on my discovery page. I don't really care for people's feeds. I just post what I post and keep it moving, respond to my DMs, respond to my comments, and that's it. Uh, I know Brendan Shaw does this thing where he would post something on social and then delete the app and then have somebody else kind of go through the comments for him um, and delete anything that's not that's not cool, whatever it may be. But I think that's a bit ag aggressive. So, like, you know, you should be able to go to a pub and not drink if you don't want to drink. You don't have to, like, you know... Re reject all places that sell alcohol it's a bit much you should have some kind of self-control and again this is only about self-control really the phones i don't have notifications which kind of stops and abates things i don't have to i have to open things specifically but again i think like this um naina 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 girl mentioned um if you're creative it probably is great to probably throw yourself into a creative pursuit the more time you're spending looking at other people, you should be spending time honing your own craft. Now, that's why I get to the point of it, like hating on people like Peggy Goo and Amelia Lenz and stuff who are smashing social and doing it without any kind of, you know, shame and being quite forthright about it. You just have to let them do it. And if you want to do something similar, do it yourself, but you don't point fingers. Instead, just create and try and make a way for yourself outside of that arena if, you're not, if that's not for you. Um, she continues, uh, this clout gen is a mad, mad time for us. Uh, post your shit that you're proud about but don't watch the numbers remember you're doing it for yourself not validation from others yeah so good advice from um this nanya girl article is written by jasmine ken smith it's called work camera flash on instagram has changed the future i'll i'll put it in the, um, in the show notes for you guys to check out yourselves and read but it's a really cool and informative uh blog post i thought you should check out for all you dj freaks out there like myself um let's continue on what else do we have here to go on about? There's so much more to go through. Oh, yeah, 2000, 2020 plans. I'm sorry, New Year's Eve 2020 plans. What are you guys up to? Um, I think I might just... Oh, sorry, we might go to like a <clears throat> a kind of, you know, burlesque cocktail night thing and just do that kind of, you know, cringy stuff. That might be cool. I'll go to a nice restaurant and get a drink. Um, the days of me going to a New Year's Eve party are well and truly gone. If anything, I might do a New Year's Day thing. I think so. But I think, um, yeah, it's just too many people. It's just the wrong type of crowd. It's usually the people that don't usually go out, go into these sort of events. I try to avoid them. But Mixmag has got a really cool um, list of places that you can check out for New Year's Eve. Uh, stuff in Manchester, Warehouse Project. You've got Mark Knight Egg. You've got MK02 Academy. Patrick Tobin playing in Edinburgh. Hannah Wants at Ministry of Sound. Cafe Mambo. Ibiza Classics at McQueen London. Eskimo Dancer 02 in Leicester. Wow. Pleasurehood Move D X a while, which would be awesome. You got Percolate at E1, Warehouse Project again all day London, and Ellen Alien at E1 again. So definitely check out the list. I'll put it again and show it for you guys to see. 11th Central New Year's Eve raves. Let's move on from that one. Um. Oh, 
I found this brand that I thought looked quite similar to Phoebe Philo and just got me thinking about what's going to happen with the new Celines out there. It's called um, Katie. Is that how you pronounce it? Kathy or Katie. I'm not sure how you pronounce the name of it. But um, I just found it because they've just released their pre-4 2020 collections. I always, I quite like pre-4. I know it got a bit of a bad rap. And I know most designers probably are fed up with pre-4 because it just adds more work to their schedule of their already, you know, hectic schedule. If you're a fashion designer, you're essentially designing, what, six collections a year or some shit, not including all the collaboration, all the personal branding and kind of white label stuff that you might do on a side. But um, I like this brand, man. It reminds me a lot of the heady days of Phoebe Philo at Celine. Again, there's a lot of kind of brands out there trying to fill that gap since Phoebe Philo um, essentially took a step back from fashion. So I'm interested to see where, what goes on there. But I'm, I'm a big fan of this brand. And there's also another brand, I think, Prenza Schuler that had another one, another look that looked quite similar to Phoebe Philo. Celine, but I just wanted to quickly go through this and show you what I thought was cool about it. They've got a little review here from a lady called Emily Farah on Vogue. It says the following that poplin button down and crystal embellished real teal dress can both be recognizable katie and pretty remarkable katie holstein who started her label quietly three years ago wow three years ago mostly jeans and sweaters chalks it up to katie being a more about feeling than just a single item which i love i love those kind of brands i, I kind of feel that with the, our legacy now and even acne is the same sort of thing it's less about you know acne started off as a jeans company and now they've kind of morphed into this behemoth magazines consultancy just all around bad boy uh, label and you get the feeling like acne just goes in completely different like no two collections are ever the same they all go completely different directions similar to like a, maybe a jaden bjornsson or even stuff he does on the web it's sort of got a similar sort of vibe it's got a feeling towards it i feel very you know there's something tangible that you can kind of feel in your hands i love that sort of thing instead of it being just it's like when rick owens described how he makes he makes clothes he just puts fabrics on models and just kind of basically forms it around that there's less sketching. It doesn't, it, it doesn't, it doesn't illustrate at all, he said, right? No illustration. It's all about feeling. It's all about touching and moving stuff around and, you know, practicality and stuff and all that malarkey, which I'm a big fan of. Um, so, yeah, three years ago. So, big up this woman, man, um, Kate Holstein. or oh, Kat Holstein. Amazing, man. Uh, chalks up to Katie being more than a feeling, than a single item. You know a cashmere sweater is Katie thanks to its plush texture and rounded seals. So, rounded sleeves, seals. <laughs> a silk blouse, obviously, Katie, because of his deep cuff and strong shoulders that teal dress is kt because it's made out of a fine finest teal and because it's cut in a romantic yet grown-up silhouette holstein doesn't do logos or meme enabled or meme able trends memeable trend sorry but that hasn't stopped the brand from going viral we wouldn't remind it of katie holmes cardigan and cashmere bra oh yeah cool i'll show that in a minute that outfit was super this super super beautiful in Sephora. so this is a the pre-4 collection from this brand called katie which i'm a fan of again i keep mentioning the name katie 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 but it looks beautiful man i really love it um i think this is a really cool uh, thing it, it even made me like kitten heels which i'm i absolutely hate kitten heels for the most part but they look incredible in this lookbook so You've got this lady here for the podcast listeners sitting down wearing a red, is it, is it velvet? Is it suede? Is it, I don't know what it is, shirt, button down. Is that the, maybe the tool button down I mentioned in the article? Maybe it was with some black trousers. Again, most of these lookbooks I like to kind of look at just because you get to steal styling tips and color combinations because, you know, I'm horrible at that sort of stuff. So if you're having a bad day, you don't know what to wear and you're kind of blocked Definitely check out uh, a brand that you like. Go through their lookbook or runway collection. You will find some stuff that you might be able to do in your wardrobe. Obviously, not the same look exactly because, you know, that brand is the brand. But you'll be able to get some styling tips there. So, yeah, the, some good looks in here overall. I love the shoot. I love the actual photography itself. This amazing white dress is amazing. Film photography on a white background. The model is just fairly plain looking, a parting, you know, a, a little middle part in there, minimal makeup and just incredible, incredible styling on it. Again, these kit and heel things, wherever they are, look incredible. They look like something your nan would wear, but they made, she made them look very, very modern and very chic. I love the cuffs on that blouse there, of course, it look beautiful. And even this as well, this little dress, I'm sure that's, a, that's the teal dress, that teal, right? Um, very, very nice, man. Very, very romantic very emotional those sandals look beautiful look at something my uncle would wear but in a very chic way i'm a big fan of everything that's in that's in there um again so very brand new, a lot of uh, phoebe filer for celine influences there which i'm sure she probably took aim from and again like all good brands in it if you're a girl and you're 
quite handy with your pattern cutting or you have a good vision and you like Phoebe Philo and Celine, why not get into fashion designing? Why not do this for yourself? Do you know what I mean? And put your name on it, on the inside. It must be quite cool. Wake up in the morning, looking into a label of your blouse and seeing your own name there, right? Of the own brand that you're kind of producing now. Yeah, just incredible styling. I love some of the poses here. Really cool stuff. Um, but obviously the most interesting thing, I think even this outfit there as well with that, the, with like a leather overcoat or a leather jacket blue indigo jeans and a white shirt that's got the kind of you know cuffs popping out from the side from the bottom that's really cool and that's sort of styling tip you could do for yourself but the most interesting part of it i thought was her instagram profile um it's really cool i love her instagram very very cool it paints a good image of the brand and yeah it's just a very nice instagram profile um i love everything about it aesthetically i love the boxes that she uses here is that a container for bot it's office and seeing a new shoe box is going out which look really cool. I love some of the stuff that she's showing in terms of stuff that she's coming soon with. This little tassel jacket that reminds me of something Vizum did previously. Um, she looks, and again, like most good brands, the designer of the brand herself looks pretty cool. I think that's her hair, right? Um, yeah, I like it. I like it. I like everything about it. And the most interesting part about it is this image, which I saw is what made the brand go viral. Is an image here of uh, Katie, what's her name? The girl used to go out with Tom Cruise. Uh, Katie Holmes wearing this card was it cashmere cardigan and bra set she made a bra that's a cashmere cashmere bra mate you know how flossy that is it's sort of like a boob tube is it got a strap on it yeah it's got a strap down the side it looks absolutely gorgeous like how good does that look on Katie Holmes like chic as fuck isn't it look at that just putting her hand up getting a cab doing her thing and what I wonder what that bag's from the jeans fit perfectly perfect amount of jewelry hair pulled back some nice shades just epic epic style isn't it absolutely love it so yeah, um, check them out if you're that way inclined. If you love a bit of Phoebe Philo and you miss her on the scene, definitely check out what Katie are doing. I love her everything. She met Barack Obama, which is pretty cool. No, she didn't. Someone else met Barack Obama, but they're wearing her outfit, which is great nonetheless. And again, just some great images of the brand itself. That's her there, right? The actual founder of the brand. So yeah, check it out, man. Um, this woman seems really fairly awesome. Three years ago, the label launched. But look at this. She's got a bit of nipple out there as well, which I'm sure has survived on Instagram because there's a little bit of a outfit on top of it that's kind of blocking the nipples, which is cool to see. But yeah, check it out, man. Really, really awesome. I love everything about this brand. And again, um, more power to what she's doing there. I'm sure she'll be more successful because of my little shout that I gave her on the podcast. <laughs> anyway, continue on here. What else we got to talk about? Oh yeah, let's go to some other streetwear news. Let's move away from the fashion talk and go to streetwear-ish kind of fashion talk. So number one news you remember I, was, I mentioned how I like the um, Balenciaga fall winter collections if, or spring summer collection, the one that recently debuted, the one that would look like similar to the one parading around the EU um, building or something. It was all in blue, had that massive kind of bell dress everyone was wearing and they had these amazing shoes there that I didn't know what they looked like. They look like biker boots. Now we've got a full image of the shoes and they look a lot better than i actually thought they would look i would assume there would have been a bit more of a boot thing but they've kind of strayed away from that and made it into a trainer so it's taking inspiration i guess from the motocross world but they've kind of co-opted it into like a sleeker runner it's called the balenciaga square toe tyrex sneaker sci-fi design so article here from um highest novelty that says the model is called the tyrex the key features include the tyrex sneaker looks something out of sci-fi film and it's constructed of many overlapping rubber panels that create an almost atomic anatomical design the name of the type of the sneaker tyrex is printed on square toe and one of the defining features of the crazy design it's going to release in 2020 in january uh, you can buy it online the editor's note introduced originally on the 2020 summer runway show the square boot shoe is now have a release date according to spanish fashion house uh, the Tyrex will be released worldwide starting in January and the Wild Design latest and long line of shoes. So yeah, let's see, check it out. I love the look of it. Again, um, as the article mentioned, loads of overlapping panels and just looks very interesting, very dissimilar. The thing, I, this is what I want to see more in fashion, this fashion houses when they're making sneakers. I want to see something that doesn't look like any other sneaker brand. It's annoying when these sneaker brands just go out, go to the Nike archives, Adidas, Reebok, a6 Puma, whatever they may be, and just dig into their archives and basically make their version of an, or of an already established boot or established shoe. I want the fashion industry to take as much time as they do in clothing or as much inspiration, as much varying levels of sources and apply that into footwear to make it more interesting. Because nowadays, the shoes from sneaker brands, especially stuff like you might see in Saint Laurent, wherever, just like, you know, 
they're just co-opting Jordan brand shoes and whacking their own logo and then hiking the price up, which isn't fun. It's not interesting. Stuff like this is more interesting. Even if you don't like it, it just looks different than what it's out on the market at the moment. Um, so it comes in this neon green, neon yellow sort of colorway, an all black, triple black colorway with like an S with like a little gray S at the back. And then you've got this sort of like faded uh, combination of like silver and black. That's again, taking inspiration from, I guess, the motocross world. So they probably took an idea from a jacket somewhere and basically implemented that into like a boot, into a shoe. Probably is quite good for a motorcycle jacket. I imagine it's probably quite padded on the toe. And yeah, it looks interesting. Man. I quite like it. It's got a little bit of a hair on it. Um, give you a little bit of a height if you're that way inclined. In general, just a very interesting shoe overall. I like it, man. I'm just see what it's going to be priced at. Um, I'm assuming something in the high 500s. We haven't had the Balenciaga sneaker yet that's been under five, innit? They've all been around that kind of price range, so probably shouldn't expect any different from this shoe. But definitely keep an eye on that if you're that way inclined. I'm a big fan of the shoe. I like what they're doing there. That's one. Bo -bo 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 -bo. Let's move on to the next one. What else do we want to talk about on here? Ba -ba 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 -ba. What else we got here? Oh, we got some Jordan brand new. So I mentioned yesterday or the other day that the Dior Jordans, I'm not really a big fan of. I think they look a bit meh. Obviously, um, details have come out now that, you know, they've essentially got um, Dior leather, real Dior jacket print on it. So that's why the price is 2000 But then now they're going to be only producing quantities of 1000 So I remember someone actually posted a picture of a pair that's available now on StockX and they're asking basically 25 grand for them, which is insane. So, you know, they're going to be... They're going to be the shoe of the year next year. They're going to be, um, they're going to induce a lot of L's for everybody trying to get them. And generally, they're not really a shoe that I would be that bothered about wearing myself, you know. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of kind of, you know, fronters out there that'll probably go and buy a fake pair from China just to kind of front in this in the club. But I'm not really a big fan of them. I think that's a bit wasted collaboration. But now, Hiroshi Fujiwara, the obviously this, the Jordan One Supremo probably only, you know, only really contested in that game. Jordan One brand wise, maybe close to maybe Philopolis um, London. I think he's quite big in the Jordan One game in it, or maybe Jordan Fives more so. But yeah, Hirsch Fujiwara is a master. Um, obviously, I've still got the fragment Jordan One somewhere around here that I'm a big fan of as well. And he has now debuted or released an upcoming Jordan One that shits all over the Dior one, I think, in my opinion. So this is the following um, Nike could finally be bringing back the Michael Jordan band airship. Uh, this is a rumor, obviously. We're not sure the details. Hiroshi just uploaded them, didn't say anything. But usually when Hiroshi uploads an item, it's definitely going to be out for release very, very soon. I'd imagine nowadays with Instagram and social media, the Nike marketing team are very aware of um, how to kind of gain a viral foothold in the industry, leaking some images or product to someone like Hiroshi who is very much respected in the Jordan 1 world. And having him post out there is probably a uh, concerted um marketing push but the text is the following anyway and uh, nike could be bringing back the airship um sorry airship i said jordan one didn't i yeah airship which is similar to a jordan one but not actually a jordan one um the sneaker worn by michael jordan during his rookie season before the air jordan one made its official debut this rumor comes following the images shared by uh nike uh sorry by fragment design founder Hiroshi Fujiwara on instagram so I remember I had a pair of airships I sold once. I remember maybe a Crooked Tongue's um, sneaker fair thing they did in Nike Town back in the day. I'm pretty sure I had a pair of... I'm pretty sure I did. I'm pretty sure I did. A, like a black and neon colorway, kind of. Hmm. Anyway, the, the um, Hiroshi debuted two colorways, a black, a red and white pair, and also a pair that's got a white reverse on it as well. It looks beautiful. Um, they remind me of an of an all court mid again. Probably take probably in my opinion a better version than a Jordan one. I like the paneling. I like that they look a bit more chunky. They're not as a slimmer silhouette as the maybe Jordan one, and would probably suit my big chunky feet a lot more. Um, the image is shown in the high piece. This high survey article says the following: the image is shown. Um, a large Nike box with half and half design below containing two sneakers, which I'm sure would be similar to the defining moments pack we we saw maybe a few years ago from Jordan brand, the ones where each num each basically shoe added up to twenty three, I think, or something along those kind of lines. And I remember I had the four and the thirteen, was it? One of them, I forgot which one it was. Or the four and the eleven. So not four and eleven, what would it be? The four and nine? I don't know, whatever my maths is. So they I remember that was kind of the package they did together and they were like three hundred dollars. So I'd imagine they'll probably do the same thing with this, where it'd be like a big massive box you'll get and they sort of fold up together and you can make it into like a little um case in your room. Um 
One is the aforementioned airship, while the other one is the red and white Jordan 1 high that comes in the OG hang tag used in 1985. Uh, with the Jordan 1 um, high turning 35 next year, which is why we're seeing loads of Jordan 1 popping out. Edison Chen's got one. Obviously, the Dior's having one. Um, loads of people, other people probably get one too. I'm surprised Don C didn't get a Jordan 1 collab, but considering the work him and Kanye did in terms of bringing back that retro and making it, you know, basically famous again. I'm sure Jordan Brown won't give him the, the probably the credit they deserve, but Don C did a lot for the Jordan brand, man. Especially the Air Jordan 1. I wonder if they want to give him one. Or even someone like a Nick Tache. He used to rock Jordan 1 all the time, innit? The Diamond Supply dude. Um, blah, blah, blah. With the Jordan 1 turn 25, it looks like the swoosh could be bringing back the airship as part of the anniversary celebrations. At this point, it's an open secret that Nike Air Jordan was never really banned. Instead, it was actually the airship the sneaker Jordan wore before the Air Jordan 1 that the NBA fined Jordan for wearing. MJ wore the airship early in his rookie season 1984. The airship did not adhere to uniform regulations due to its color scheme, caused the NBA to find Jordan every time he wore the games during the games. And there we go. We've got two shoes here. We've got the airship PE and we've got the 1985 Air Jordan 1 on either side with the different um, logos on it. Okay, it's one box together. It doesn't fold up, which looks pretty cool. I like that. One side airship, one side Jordan 1. Um, Nike, of course, has never openly admitted to this being the case, though the brand has acknowledged airship on its official timeline of Air Jordans. It's already been rumored that Nike will be dropping a true to the OG Nike Air Jordan Chicago during the NBA also weekend in Chicago next year, which I'm sure... Uh, Don C will probably be involved in with that one, so it would make sense for other historic moments and stories associated with the sneaker to make a comeback. So, as always, stay tuned for updates. Yeah, I like them, man. I'm a big fan of them. I would probably get both. Um, you would probably have to buy both in the actual pack itself, so that's not really a hard stretch. But yeah, I like them. I like the shoe. I like how clean they look. And again, this is what I want to see from my retros. I want to see them done in a very um, luxe way taking a lot of you know attention to detail these are some things these are obviously shoes that are going to be primarily aimed towards actual sneaker heads and fans of the jordan brand as opposed to sneaker reseller people they're not loud they're not crazy patterns and stuff of course they're going to sell for a lot they're probably going to go for high resale but again something that sneakers are going to love sneakers are going to appreciate i'm a big fan of them love what they're doing there um more power to them and hopefully we'll be able to get more details of those coming up very soon let's move on What else we have here in the list to talk about? Du, 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 du. Maybe not that. What else we talking about? Oh, um, North Face Purple label. Are you a fan of that? I am. Um, North Face Purple label, if you're aware, is a kind of Japan only Pacific North Face label that's a lot better than stuff that you get here. It's, it's super depressing seeing North Face Purple label because when you go into places like the North Face shop in Westfield, Stratford, which I'm sure has a little section of pur Purple Face, sorry, um, Purple label stuff at the moment. But back in the day or back beforehand, before, you know, the rise of the internet and people buying stuff on proxy on the, on the interwebs, you can only get them online via proxy store. You couldn't get them in store. And it was quite depressing because the stuff they have in Japan is so much better than the stuff you get in the UK. But it was hard to buy stuff in Japan because most of the Japanese purple label stuff was made for the Japanese silhouette or Japanese body types. And if you know anything about Japanese brands and buying stuff online um, from Rakuten or from Bud Service and stuff, you would know that the cut on Japanese clothing is... A lot different to European cut. It's a lot more boxy, a lot more square, a lot more short. Um, so sometimes you think you're an XL or a large and it comes into your house and you end up being like, you know, this is not, this is like a, a European medium or European, you know, medium to large. So it's hard to get that sort of stuff. But now I think with the rise of the internet, the North Face team are now maybe being a little bit more liberal with their sizing and stuff is generally tends to fit Europeans a lot more better because I see a lot of accounts um around the around europe carrying purple label stuff so i'm assuming the cuts a lot better and i'm assuming some of the buying team are probably lending uh feedback and telling the brands uh, hey you should cut this a bit better so our customers can wear it i'd assume so it's good to see the resurgence of it and here's a little um article from high stop IE detailing the fall winter 19 collection that's hitting europe very soon it says the following, as North Face celebrates the 25 years of the Himalayan suit, the North Face purple label uh, by Namika is um, launching a new collection available to buy in Europe for the first time. This, okay, it's the first time. But I'm pretty sure they had it available in some accounts, some stores. I'm going to say even Goodhood. Maybe somebody else had it as well. Um, 
what, which one's the one in West London? I'm pretty sure. Or Garbsaw had some purpose for his label as well. Or maybe I'm, I'm imagining. I'm not sure anyway. As it continues, the collection takes inspiration from the North Face archive pieces and creates a strikingly styled season look for fall into 19. Puffer coats, mountain jackets, and cargo pocket anoraks lend a technical touch to the much more blue collared goods with plenty of relaxed hoodies, trim sweaters, and more. Cozy, fuzzy Denali fleece is present with other classic and not face outwear samples, staples like the Sierra Parker and Noopsie jacket are reimagined with a more relaxed look. They're complemented by an array of staple accessories that range from the knit beanies and socks to waist bags and trim sacon pouches. What's it? Sashu, Sashu pouches. I don't know what that word is. Limited edition collection drops exclusively in North Face, Carnaby Street Store. Oh, see, there we go. They're definitely bringing stuff here. Uh, December the 3rd. Browse the collection for above details. So you got here an amazing yellow jacket in a really nice style, nice relaxed fit. I wonder what, what what are the trainers here? This dude's wearing in this fit. Are they MX ninety fives? What are they? Yeah, MX ninety fives, isn't it? Nice. I like that. So you have got a nice little yellow jacket there. You've got some hats in here too, like a little corduroy hat. If you're that way inclined, the little stud hat, the beanie on this girl looks amazing. I love that fleece. You've got a reimagined Nupsi. I'm assuming that's the one there. It's a bit more hmm. It's got like a plaid lining on it plaid finish some great sweatpants again that fleece that that look there slide number four wherever this is there it looks amazing you've got like a purple lilac fleece some nice detailing on the zip and you've got these amazing pants with whatever what shoes you're wearing there vans chuckers yeah that's very <laughs> japanese style some chucker vans and some kind of tracksuit pants very very on brand reminds you of something like dime would do very very cool i love that completely everything about that of course this yellow fleece looks beautiful um, you got a Denali jacket there and a hoodie, a nice Denali and nice jeans or is it North Face jeans? I'd be mad if they were doing that. You got an amazing anorak jacket and obviously the pouch, sweatpants, some nice New Balances again. Yeah, so all all all, all over, all around, all all in conclusion, all in all, whatever that word is, it's a very nice collection, very well done, great styling as per usual. What you sort what you expect from the you know Japanese side of things, and again, much better than anything you'll find on a you know, mainline North Face site. So definitely go check that out at the London Carnaby Street store. Hopefully some of it's still available for you guys that have the money to purchase it. And if it isn't, is still available and North Face are watching, I take a large in an Excel. Thank you very much. Okay, cool. Let's move on from that one. Mm -mm -mm. What else do we have to talk about before we head out here, heading into an hour? Oh, we got these Nike um, ACG mocks. I'm, I mentioned it previously that mocks are one of my favorite shoes that I hadn't necessarily given an equal run of the stick. I'm just going to try and find an outfit of mine wearing them, actually, so I can show you that I'm really about this life. But um, Nike Air mocks are one of the most underrated shoes out there. And I think in general, Nike ACG, right? It's probably one of the most underrated um, divisions of Nike. I think it's thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly um, uh, underexposed, underexploited, underused. People don't pay too much attention. And I guess like all Nike archive pieces, especially stuff that people are not aware of, it's just going to take one cool person. I don't know, someone that everyone likes on social media, a Luca, an ASAP Rocky, an ASAP Nast, a Neon Connor. Uh, a, a young lord wherever it may be right one of those people are going to have to come out and wear some hg pieces to, to kind of get it sky high i know they tried to get the acronym dude to kind of do some stuff that didn't really work out now they, they they're kind of doing it in-house but hg hasn't really taken up and i'm not sure why but it's one, honestly one of my favorite favorite divisions of nike and one of my favorite pieces from there is the mock right the nike mock it's a weird shoe. I think it was inspired by a potato or some shit. I remember the designer saying something about it's inspired by the potato. And I'm a big fan of it. I wore it for many years when I was um, very much interested in sneaker culture. I had this brown pair here that I've got here on screen. I'm going to upload it for you here. That's all the OG way colorways. You've got this sort of like stony colorway. You've got this nice mud color and a black color. I had a black and this sort of stony colorway that I had for a while that I used to wear all the time. So much so that I'm going to show you a fit of me actually wearing them if I can find them on my Flickr account. Do you remember Flickr? Yep, still got mine. Um, see if I can find them here. I've got saved in my albums of all my outfits from back in the day, which is quite cringe, but you know, it is the way that it is. Where can I find my what did I wear today post? Where is it? I've got a whole album. Yeah, I've got 250, 59 posts, photos of me wearing outfits, nearly 260 pictures of me wearing clothes, right? And some of them are going to contain an air mock, I'm pretty sure. Let me see if I can find some of the swaggy outfits I wore back in the day. 
Oh, I've got an ACG here actually that I'm going to show you that you, that, that you should, that you might like. Where is it? Mm-mm. This is an ACG too. Uh, what was that? It's a, that's, that's the Arriva Dutchie, isn't it, right? So I've got an Arriva Dutchie shoe here that obviously I'm showing you from there, from 2008, uploaded on Flickr. Amazing, epic content over there. And then let me see if I can find the mock. There's an image of me wearing a Nike mock, I think with like a, um, a Hiroshi Fujiwara Nike sportswear jacket thingy that I had, I'm pretty sure. See if I can find it. Do, 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 do. Let's go back to the album and scroll down. See if I can find that picture of me wearing the mocks. I think it's one of my honestly one of my favorite shoes and a shoe that I wish I could kind of get back into now. But I don't really wear that sort of style anymore, so it's hard to do it again. But let me see if I can find it here. I had absolute swag back then, and I? I was always flossing me. So here, here's the image of me wearing the shoe. Woohoo! So this is the, me wearing the Air Mock. I've got, um, what's the hoodie again? That's from, uh, that's one of the old Hiroshi Fujiwari brands, but a very Japanese inspired outfit, as you can see here from the picture. I've got a nice sportswear raincoat on and a nice t-shirt underneath, some jeans rolled up in the Air Mocks with my socks showing. Got a good enough t-shirt, good enough fleece, a review dirty showing there. Yep. I was all about that life. Obviously, Nike Air stabs there and some other stuff I was wearing. But yeah, I'm a big fan of Nike Air Mock, but they're going to bring it back, right? They're bringing back the Nike Air Mock and they're bringing it back in a different sort of style something that we haven't seen previously it's sort of like a weird north face sock thing the shoe that north face did um it's here on heights and Abiety. i'm pretty going to show you on the screen so this is the nike acg new mock 3.0 is for the campsite recovery and casual days in the city and i'll wear i prefer to wear stuff like this than sandals the sandal thing is I'm not really a big fan of so it looks a little bit like the north face thing that you might have seen this the kind of shoe that they have um, let me see for local image down below. The key features of Nike ATG Mock 3.0 features an asymmetrical upper for easy and on and off, as well as a footscape inspired chassis with a Nike Solar Soft a cushioning. Okay, so it's got a Nike. Okay, so it's different from the Mock. It's got a footscape sole, essentially without the laces. It's not really a Mock, is it really? Does, do they call it a Mock 3.0? Okay, it's a bit of a hybrid, isn't it? I'm not really a fan of hybrids. Anyway, say, see, let's go again. Editor's note says the following, the Nike SCG will soon be releasing the latest iteration of the Mock, which originally released in 1994 for campsite rest and relaxation. Similar to the original Mock, the 3.0 is outfitted with a simple upper and soft sole and sneaker incomprising, incorporates the new Footscape inspired sashi with Nike sole and soft cushioning. But I still like the OG, man. I think the OG is better, isn't it? That's so nice, right? That compared to whatever the 3.0 looks like. They should just update, they should have just updated that upper with the footscape sole, I would have quite liked that as, and then maybe with the same sort of tread at the bottom, instead of having that weird sort of like, let me go back to where is it? Uh, over here, right? Let me move this over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where is it? Where is it? Instead of having this weird sort of like overlapping flat thing, right? I'm not really a fan of that. I think they should have just done that upper with that sole, would have probably worked better. And the similar tread, and again, with the swoosh in the front, it just looks a bit weird. Um, releases in cheetah print colorway exclusive at Union LA and Japan nice tie in there in terms of the I like the fact that they're releasing shoes at specific stores that would probably be more receptive to actually buying a shoe that makes more sense as opposed to like flooding these all over size and offspring and stuff you know cust general customers aren't probably going to wear these unless they're on sale but again I prefer the OGs I think the OG looks a lot more better I would probably soul swap if somebody could soul swap those with a footscape so i'd be super down for it um but yeah that's a new version of the mock 3.0 it looks probably better from the side in it so imagine that on the side so this one like this image there on the side with that soul that looks super cool in it i reckon but yeah um again i'm not really a fan of hybrids and i don't like the fact that they kind of essentially took everything away from the mock that makes it special and just turned it into like a a tent on your shoe but again you know I'm, I'm glad they're at least going back into ACG archives and trying to bring back some of these iconic shoes that I think have been undervalued in the sneak industry at the moment. I quite like the other colorway, actually. That's quite nice. And the old black one's really cool, I think. So this one there, that looks pretty nice. But yeah, check it out. It's going to be out when? A little bit. December 9th at Union LA and Union Japan. So check it out if you're near those places and like the shoe, of course. Um, what else do we have here? We'll talk about that. What else we got there? Oh, it's like Rocky wore a big suit at the Fenty show, isn't it? That reminds me of some of the Balenciaga pieces and pieces, bits and pieces people are doing. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen it already, but um, this was during the what award ceremony was this? Um, 
So this is a picture of Ace Rocky wearing the, the suit. It's a bit puffy. I thought it was Rick Owens at first because he's been head to toe in Rick Owens the last few days, but it's obviously, it's actually Fenty. I'm not sure why it's all puffed out. Maybe it's because it's got some pile lining on it, similar to this Balenciaga um, over fleece thing that I have. Maybe it's a bit puffy inside. I'm not sure, sure, but I like the cut of it. I like the fact that it's got this sort of velvet lapels on there. Um, the buttons, of course, the shape of it. I love the trousers. It's very in tune with what he's wearing on his feet, the Rico and Gio baskets. Um, no, they're not Gio baskets. What are they? Ramon, sorry. So the article from Heister Bites is the following. ASAP Rocky's uh, humongous Fenty suit sums up a year in wild formal wear. When ASAP Rocky turned up at the Grammys and wearing a flamingo pink Luebe suit back in February, he set the tone for what would prove to be a curious year of the men's footwear front. I mean, formal wear front. Mm, I'm not sure if he's setting the tone for everybody. Uh, maybe it's people that read this site. Um, over the last sort of months, we've observed pop culture's biggest tastemakers execute all styles of suits in myriad of creative ways. I quite like the the bigger kind of comfortable double-breasted suits that you're seeing a lot of the people wearing in Petty Umo and stuff. A bit more relaxed, less skinny. I think there was, a, there was an era where everyone was wearing spray-painted, um, basically tights, in terms of their suits but now there's a bit more of a boxier fit a little bit more loose a little bit more fun the fabrics look like you could just wear the suit all day long you can probably roll up the tr your your cuffs and play a bit of football put them down and go to dinner uh take off your jacket and do some push-ups you know what i mean they look really comfortable so i like that um but also like this kind of big oversized um uh suit where essentially you're relying on the cut you're relying on expert pattern cutters to get it right because you know there's a real big there's a real fine line between it being boxy and just looking like a cheap, you know, three dollar suit that something like a Colby Covington would wear, and obviously something that's a bit more designery, um, similar to this overcoat that I'm similar to this fleece I'm wearing from Balenciaga. Like, there's only so you know, there's a fine line between this looking like some Sholo shirt that I picked up in a you know army surplus store, and obviously it costing whatever it costs. So it continues. Um, over the last sort of months, we've observed pop culture's biggest tastemakers execute styles of myriad of creative ways. There were, uh, sorry, there have been suits with clashing patterns, suits tucked into riding boots and suits in neon colors and even suits that arrive in belts. Um, at the same time, there's been a resurgence of tailoring as Halle Simmons inexorable influence as Celine begins to reverberate on a lot of guys. A special mention must go to Drake, who remains unwavering in his commitment to looking like an uh, it was great gangster or whatever. There. Oversized suits um, also popped up frequently with Marc Jacobs. Um, at last night's British Fashion Awards, Rocky again took relaxed tailoring to the extreme, stepping out on the red carpet in Rico and sneakers and a rapper's bellowing custom two-piece Rihanna new Fenty line was less than Tom Ford and more David Bryan. Um, hopefully we see this coming out. Hopefully we see more Fenty. Because I, 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 has Fenty actually announced she's going to do a men's? I don't think she has, isn't it? This might be just a one away for Rocky, but hopefully we get to see more of this from them um, in different colours. Imagine this in like a really kind of rusty red, uh, maybe like a burnt orange, uh, maybe a, a kind of a really washed out green, a weird kind of like... Um, washed out purple they look super good i would really like to see it maybe in some prints they look amazing um so a baggy outfit from it's a custom piece i'm assuming right that she got made for rocky which is because they're both walking down the runway and you know rihanna looks incredible as well herself uh did it work reactions have been mixed but let's remember rocky is usually far ahead of the curve okay they're wanking him off too much on here and taking into account perhaps it's not a time to start raiding your dad's closet for enormous but again raiding your dad's closet is all you like you're not going to look like that in it because that's cut expertly as well the way the trousers sit um you can obviously tell you know they they fit well in the waist and kind of bellow out towards the basically the thigh all the way down and then you've got obviously the jacket where essentially the shoulder and the arms are basically filled out and puffed out a lot more than what they actually look like it kind of, it kind of reminds me a little bit of the tom tom brown cut of a suit where he makes them puffy but they still fit really well which again is expert pattern cutting by everybody involved so definitely check out that image i'm not sure if you're going to see much of it in retail stores but hopefully with the reaction they got on social they're looking at it because i'll definitely be up for buying some men's fenty because Rihanna is everything, and this suit looks like something that I would wear. I like it, man. I like how it looks, especially with the Rick Owens. It looks really cool. Um, so, yeah, let's move on from that as well. And then... Da, da, da. I think that's it, man. Yeah, we ended. So, we're already 110 in. I don't waste too much of your time, and I've got to head off to work. It's actually on the English show, episode number 266. That's does, say, says. 
um thank you so much for tuning in as per usual if you're watching via the youtube smash that like button click subscribe come back another day um obviously leave me a comment if you have some comments regarding what i am talking about any questions any points of contrition whatever it may be if you're listening via the podcast app leave me a five star review so people can find the show and apart from that enjoy your week enjoy thursday get wasted if you want to but i fouls you i'd wait until friday and i'll see you guys again on the other side for another to show until then take care be safe make sure when you cross the road look left and right drink loads of water peace